morning, everybody. We are very glad here from ASA and CR to present today uh, the gas volume of the annual report on the results of monitoring the internal electricity and gas markets. And as you know, we can, uh, as shown on the next slide, um, the MMR, as it is called, or as, it, as the, another acronym uh, says, uh, is, uh, consists of uh, three big volumes. So we mentioned <coughs> gas wholesale volume, the electricity wholesale volume, and last but not least, the energy retail and consumer protection volume. Uh, as, as you can see now on this uh, slide, as you know, last uh, year we had for the first time combined various uh, consumer and retail uh, volumes into one big energy retail and consumer protection volume. And uh, we think that this uh, shows in a, in a more concise and comprehensive way uh, the um, situation on retail markets and uh, for consumers. Uh, as this is the ultimate goal, of course, of all regulation on the wholesale level uh, to bring benefits uh, for the consumer so uh, that the consumer has a uh, wide variety from which he can choose in terms of price and uh, quality. Uh, so therefore, we want to have this overview. And of course, we have uh, the wholesale uh, market, gas market, internal gas market and internal uh, electricity volume, where we look in particular at the development of the internal market. And uh, today uh, we start uh, with presenting you the gas wholesale volume and the other two, the electricity wholesale volume and the energy retail and consumer protection volumes, they will follow until the end of 2021. Uh, so we are working hard on this uh, to capture all the developments uh, in uh, 2020. And with this, I would like uh, to, and we present you this uh, today. Now uh, I will hand over in a minute. Then we also have a speaker from the European uh, Commission uh, to comment on this. Uh, and afterwards, there is a Q&A session. And of course, you can submit uh, questions via the Q&A. Uh, and in the end, we will have some conclusions uh, from Dennis Hessling, the head of the infrastructure, gas and retail uh, department from ASA. So with this, I would like to hand over first uh, to Joaquin Garcia and Mitya Maletin from the market monitoring uh, unit in uh, ASA. Please over to you, Joachim and Mitya. Yes, thanks a lot, Arigret, and good morning, everyone. Uh, I would start with some uh, introductory remarks uh, before discussing the content slides. And this is a bit the introduction for the gas wholesale volume that we will be presenting today. So uh, I would start by saying that we are in, already in the 10th edition of the, of the report and that we intend to release the volume on the 14th of July. This is a bit earlier than in previous editions of the, of the report. And the reason is that, that we were trying this year to make uh, the, the findings uh, a bit more updated uh, given the relevant uh, market uh, developments that, that are taking place. So the, 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 the volume will consist uh, of four chapters. Uh, it will uh, maintain the three traditional chapters. One is about the status of the internal gas market or the gas market developments. Another one is about the revision of the of the half functionality that we do uh, making use of the acer gas target model that we are uh, calculating house making use of remit data and the third chapter the traditional chapter is about the market effects of, of gas network codes um, but also this year as a novelty we are including a, a new uh, chapter that looks into the gas sector decarbonization uh, with a number of uh, quantitative assessments about the prices the production volumes and other considerations that also we thought that would be uh, interesting to, to include this year, given given all the discussions uh, that you are very familiar with. And, and finally, uh, also the report uh, includes recommendations to overcome the barriers that we, we try to detect through, through the volume, and this will be the part that Marcus will, will present. So with that, I start to, to discuss a bit of the findings and the highlights of each of, of the sections uh, of the chapters. So, the first one, uh, let me, okay, this has been done. Um, yeah. So about the, the, the recent market developments of, of the state of the market, uh, we wanted to discuss with you today 
how it was has been the, the overview of the of the prices uh, and we make use here of the benchmark of TTF month ahead uh, contracts because yeah, TTF can be used more and more as a, as a benchmark for overall price formation in Europe uh, given the, the strong uh, correlation between price correlation and, and enhancing price convergence between between markets. So we argue that there is a, a combination of drivers that are determining the prices for some years and will keep determining in the in the years to come, and that these drivers what are resulting in is, a, is an, an enhanced volatility. If we observe the, the the figure here, we see that there were uh, a, a very low prices in in the spring uh, last year. Uh, this was coinciding with with uh, the COVID uh, effects. Uh, so and, and I think uh, prices reached four uh, four euros per megawatt hour uh, at the time, which were all all ever lows. So demand is one of these drivers. Uh, for example, now prices have uh, significantly recovered, and and, and in these in these days we are at maximums of ten years in, in prices because demand has also recovered and, and also the the, the need uh, to replete the, the storage. Uh, is putting upward pressure on prices. So demand would be one of the, of the drivers that we wanted to discuss. The other driver is the, the volumes of LNG sorting uh, into, into Europe uh, that are also affecting a lot in the price formation. In fact, since the fall of 2018, we have had uh, significant volumes of, of, of LNG sorting into Europe, and these extra volumes have contributed to put upward pressure on prices. Uh, but as you know, also since since the end of, of 2020 and, and now in these months, what we are observing is reduced uh, volumes of LNG coming into into Europe, and then this is resulting in in upward in, in upward pressure on prices. Um, the third uh, element or the third factor affecting price formation that we discuss is the the price of the EUAS or the emission allowances uh, that are <clears throat> also impacting on, on price formation. And what we observe is that some, since the since the end of, of last year, uh, the US prices have been over 40 euros per, per ton. And this is in fact putting our pressure on, on, on gas prices because these high US prices uh, contribute to the switches uh, from coal to gas in power generation. Uh, and then um, as, a, as a result of these switches, demand for gas increases and then the prices of gas increase. So this is a bit overall the, the price levels of gas and, and the drivers and what, what we discuss is how these prices of gas um, stand or compare with the prices of low carbon gases that are expected to, to constitute the more and more <clears throat> um, production volumes in, in the years to come. So in one of the analysis that we have tried to do looking at uh, a, dif a different number of studies is analyzing the, the price level of the different low carbon gases production technologies. And what we observe is that the price gap between low carbon gases and, and conventional gas is still quite significant. Um, is for the low, uh, for the cheapest of the low carbon gases, which is biogas, is still between 20 and, and 40 euros. And for the green hydrogen, that is called to, to be very <clears throat> relevant in the, in the years to come, uh, is much more significant. Is the green hydrogen production cost Will be still on the 100 euros per megawatt hour. So a number of of elements. Um, sorry, uh, I think too much. A number of elements will determine the price formation of low carbon <clears throat> gases in the years to come, and we uh, discussed that these are the technology uh, evolution and investments scale, the cost of the renewables, uh, the raw materials of upgrading the grid. How these and prices will evolve is to be seen for example the international energy agency considers that the price of green hydrogen could be as competitive as blue hydrogen by the end of the decade by decreasing by 30 percent so the price the prices of, of low carbon gases indeed will be one of the main drivers affecting the the penetration of the production levels of of low carbon gases and what we have done in in this year you know, what we are trying to do is tracking what is the progression of the penetration of these low carbon gases and what we observe is that in the last decade uh, the volumes have doubled and now account for four percent of the total gas production from two percent uh, when when one decade ago 
the expectation is that by by the mid of the century, by 2050, low carbon gases would constitute 100 percent of the total production uh, of the total gas uh, gas source energy consumption. And in this uh, aim, there will be a, a gradual rise uh, of of this penetration. Uh, by 2030, the expectation is that uh, low carbon gases will account for between 20, I'm sorry, between 10 and 50 percent of the total gaseous energy, and and will be uh, well with a variety of technologies, including biogas or or green hydrogen. Uh, by mid-century, as I said, uh, low carbon gases would constitute, uh, given the decarbonization ambitions, all all the all the gas. Uh, and what is to be expected, indeed, is uh, um, uh, lower reliance on the uh, external imports. So given the nature of the production of these gases, they will be much more produced in-house in Europe. So what we are uh, expecting or, or the studies are expecting that the reliance on external imports will decrease from 70% or 70, 80% uh, uh, these days up to 30 uh, or 40% in, in, in the middle of the decade. In parallel, the expectation is that the demand for, for gas and energy will will decrease. Uh, what will be the, the final number is, is to be seen, but for example, some assessments from ENSOC uh, in their scenarios point to 20 to 40 percent of decrease uh, in, in comparison to the previous, to, to, to these days by the middle of the decade. So this is for the low carbon gases. And then finally, some considerations about the third part uh, of the third chapter where we analyze the, the state of the uh, market integration and the, and the hub market functionality, uh, making use of this gas target model metrics. So uh, we traditionally do an assessment of what is the uh, functionality of, of each individual member state gas hub. And we do this assessment making use of this gas target model metrics. And in our categorization, we determine that there are four, uh, four categories of, of hubs. We argue that the most um, uh, or well, the better functioning hubs are those hubs in in the in the Netherlands, TTF, and and in the UK, MVP, that we name here as established hubs. And the more differential factor for this category is the the liquidity degree in forward products. So these two hubs, and chiefly TTF, more and more for the continental Europe, are the hubs that are uh, positioning themselves like the the hubs that enable a more uh, deep uh, hedging of, of portfolios or looking forward in the more in, in the future. And they have a, a quite significant difference with other hubs that in other categories, for example, in Northwest Europe, and they have uh, a less, less forward liquidity uh, and other hubs that are uh, uh, starting to emerge, but uh, in South Southeast or, or Central Europe, but are still offering uh, quite limited uh, forward liquidity. And, and that's why they are characterizing in, in, in a lower category. So in, in the graph, what we are presenting here are the number, as an illustration, is the number of uh, the average daily month and head trades. And as you can see in, in TDF, for example, we are talking about thousands of month and head trades on daily basis, while in, in hubs in other categories, less liquid, we will be talking about dozens or even in the units. So our observations, what point uh, here, this map, what we analyze is what are the average <coughs> uh, sourcing cost price differentials between the different hubs uh, in comparison to the uh, Dutch hub, TTF, that we take as benchmark. And uh, if in each of the member states, you will see a dot with a, with a given color. And the yellow dots will <coughs> identify those, those hubs, those markets, what, whose price difference to TDF is, is, has been less than one euro per megawatt hour in, in the last five years. And then gradually from blue or, or brown, this, this price difference increase. And what we observe and, uh, and the observations tend to, to, to reveal is that the price levels uh, tend to be, uh, the um, price convergence uh, and, and, better, and better price formation tend to be observed in those hubs that are more liquid, more competitive, more, more integrated. And price differentials tend to increase in those markets that are still reliant more on long-term contracts or, or, and, and less on gas hubs. 
So what we argue in, in that is that an enhanced construction of the of the uh, internal gas market based on the gas target model and integration of the of the markets uh, on the on the on the hub model um, will still deliver significant difference, uh, significant benefits for for EU consumers. And with that, I pass uh, the floor to my colleague Mitya Maletin, who will discuss uh, the effects of, of network codes. Uh, good morning, also from my side. Uh, Joaquin, can you actually go back a slide just for a second? Yep. Um, so, as maybe an introduction to our network code analysis, um, is to say um, one of the factors behind the um, improvement in gas market functioning in recent years has also been the implementation of gas network codes. Um, Beside the, besides the increased transparency and the welcome degree of uh, harmonization across uh, the EU, network codes have also uh, promoted competition uh, and market integration through the implementation of market-based rules. Um, and as it, an example of this is maybe now you can go to the next slide, Joaquin. Um, uh, has been the implementation of the uh, capacity allocation uh, mechanism network code um, which uh, this graph is an il illustration of an analysis that we do and it looks at uh, the booking trends at EU cross-border points um, it's the, as well as into uh, the future the evolution of booked capacity up to uh, the year 2034. Um, so um, maybe briefly about the slide, uh, what you can see is uh, up to the end of 2020, uh, what the booking trends have been, and from 2020 onwards, what the current levels of booked capacity are. So it's not a modeling projection, uh, it's a uh, capacity that has been uh, booked so far, taken as a snapshot at the end of 2020. And the different colors represent the different types of capacity booked uh, with the biggest share, especially in 2018, 2019, and 2020, and gradually decreasing afterwards, uh, legacy booked capacity that uh, has been booked prior to the implementation of the network code. Uh, so, what does the, our analysis show? We see um, relatively high replacement of, re, re, uh, of expired legacy booked capacity at EU level so far. However, when we look at individual zones, and in particular individual IPs, uh, we see that the picture is more nuanced, where um, some IPs have had their expired capacity fully exp uh, replaced, and others only seeing new bookings um, sporadically when market conditions uh, indicate that it would be profitable and many IPs falling somewhere in between with parts of ca expired capacity replaced and parts uh, responding to market price signals. We And we think about this uh, also in terms of what role uh, certain IPs play. Are they core to supply? Then they tend to be fully, fully replaced are they more residual supply than they ten, tend to respond to market? The, their shippers respond with bookings only when market price signals are favorable. Another thing that we observe is that shippers have, with a few exceptions, a clear preference for booking short-term capacity, by which I mean not uh, daily and within-day products necessarily, but up to one gas year ahead. Um, <clears throat> the exception to this was, uh, you can see in the graph is the orange line, which was uh, capacity booked in 2017 and is um, related to uh, network, network points intended to take, uh, to transport gas from Nord Stream to uh, onwards in several uh, EU member states. What do we see 
for the following years. Uh, we don't know for certain, but we expect that uh, as more long-term capacity expires uh, at relevant IPs, and th these are the call-out boxes that you can see in the graph. They indicate when certain uh, IPs capacity will expire. Uh, uh, possibility of lower booking levels uh, in the EU. And this is due to some factors that Joaquin has already mentioned. So an increasing role of LNG uh, in gas supply, which may displace some need for cross-border flows, uh, stagnation in gas demand, and as well as the production of low carbon gases, which could be uh, uh, domestically produced and so therefore, the need for, for cross-border transportation um, could uh, diminish. Uh, can you move to the next slide, please? So with more capacity expiring, um, tariffs are set to play an increasing role in shaping uh, market outcomes in the internal gas market. That's why the analysis of the MMR is uh, focusing more and more on, on this topic. Uh, in the figure that you see, uh, there are examples. Uh, this is an example of, of a type of analysis that we have done in this MMR that focuses on tariffs and the possible effects of uh, the tariff network code. The figure shows um, a couple, a, se a selected couple of examples where uh, the implementation of the tariff network code coincided with the relevant change of the applied tariff. And it shows the before and after situation for tariff in, uh, the, in the blue bar. And uh, a couple of key uh, market uh, indicators uh, in the other bars. The, the gray is the market spread, and, uh, and then uh, in green, there are two measures of uh, IP utilization. So uh, how much has been booked and how much has been utilized. Um, so what our monitoring results show is that in 2020, at least, uh, irrespective whether tariffs increased or decreased, Price, uh, price spreads between uh, the relevant markets decreased. But we think this is mostly due to the exceptional um, circumstances of uh, 2020, which uh, Joaquin already described uh, in detail, but lower demand, uh, surge in LNG meant historically low prices, which today seem um, like a, a different uh, world perhaps. Um, but what we saw is in this um, oversupplied market, um, market price integration or price convergence uh, increased. Uh, so we are not taking this result as uh, conclusive. Uh, we will keep monitoring uh, what the effects of uh, tariff changes and the tariff network code uh, will be in the years to come. Uh, and with that, I'd like to hand over to Marcus, who will talk about the recommendations uh, from this year's MMR. Okay, great. Thanks, Mitya. And also good morning from my side. So I'm here with the last slide on this uh, for this part, so the recommendations. And I would uh, have structured them in basically in three main areas, uh, along which also the recommendations in the report are then structured. So basically, First of all, I think we've seen um, the gas market functioning very, very positive, continue to improve and also process progress despite uh, this challenging, challenging situation in 2020. So, uh, and again, I think the conclusion is that three quarters of sort of European gas demand are already also in a situation where market price integration is very high, uh, but, so that's that's very positive, and I think in this spirit, in this in this direction, I think it's also to further and to keep fully uh, further implementing the network code, where maybe this has not yet been done or not, uh, well, done completely. 
And this, I think, for this, there are the, the, the more detailed also implementation monitoring reports on the on the network codes, which uh, shed some more detailed uh, information on that. And secondly, of course, uh, for those uh, and then for those specific situations where there are still shortcomings, we would uh, sort of recommend to to apply a sort of a targeted regulation, meaning to really look at the circumstances and then sort of from a regulatory toolkit to apply certain measures that would sort of improve or support the development of the market on a case-by-case -case basis. So that's the first area. Second area is to really, and that's a very important moving forward, to, to have a certain flexibility and to really, to, to re really keep on working on that because we, we are seeing very much evolving market circumstances and for example, as you probably know, we have a funk case where we look into sort of the frequency of the auctions and the variety of products. So this is ongoing work and I think we're very much looking forward to this process to see also together with Enzok what, how we could improve that and maybe provide further flexibility for capacity booking. Secondly, and also the third point are more than related to tariffs, also very important. I think here, first of all, if we look at the multipliers, we see that it really makes sense to also regular, regularly monitor the effects that the multipliers can have on, on, on sort of um, between uh, adjacent markets and uh, to really also have a, a very coordinated approach when setting multipliers at the borders so that there is a sort of um, also sort of the cross-border um, transport is not unnecessarily affected by multipliers. So it's of course a, a multi-dimensional um, task to, when setting multipliers, but this should be done in a, on a regular basis to really follow also the market uh, evolving market circumstances. Third point is more also looking again forward with uh, generally the effects of trans transmission tariffs, but in a sort of situation where we have future changes in network utilizations. So there, this is very as a, this is very probable, and I think we will see changes. And the the, the task would he, would he be here now to really try as as good as we can today to have a, a view on these changes and to anticipate these changes also when setting a lot revenues and to sort of really ensure that tariffs are remain affordable and also so, so sustainable in the in the longer term yeah and last uh, but not least on this point we would say i mean overall i think when developing network codes further we really need to uh, ensure that they are fit for purpose fit for the decarbonization shift in the coming decades so generally speaking. Yeah, and the last point, third area here on the on the slide on the recommendations would, I mean, this is uh, basically from our white papers, which we have published earlier on this year. I think generally, for example, we, we see that the main principles of, of the today's uh, internal gas market work well, and we would like to maintain the, fun the well functioning of the market also uh, when new low carbon gases are sort of coming into the market. So this is very important to maintain this. I think also from our side, it's clear that we need to clearly separate between what's regulated activity and what's sort of market-based activities and to, to really ensure this also going forward, the separation. And uh, also for sort of the upcoming topic on hydrogen networks, I think here we, we really argue for step a uh, flexible and gradual approach so going forward we need to really understand how the markets will evolve and then to implement sort of uh, the, the required regula re regulatory steps as we go forward yeah uh, network tariffs of course i think we would see there that this is should not be i mean should not be there to subsidize certain low carbon gases uptake it should be set in a cost reflective and non-discriminatory way that's the, the main principles which should remain in place also going forward. Yeah, and last but not least, I think it's very important for the for the market-based uh, uptake of renewable and low carbon gases to really have a well-functioning scheme rolled out of guarantees of origin for renewable and low carbon gases. So and 
we think that these will be instrumental then to really enable the uptake of, of these renewable and low carbon gases. Okay, so so much for the recommendations and for, for this part. And I've, I'm happy now and very happy that Bartek Gurba from the European, European Commission found the time. I think it's very challenging times for him, but uh, found the time to also join us. So we are very happy to have you with us. And yeah, if we go to the next slide, I think we're now uh, also interested to learn your views on sort of how you would take these findings forward also and what challenges and priorities you would see from the European Commission. Bartek, the yes. floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Markus, and uh, also previous speakers. Thank you very much for, uh, as always, as every year, the, the very good uh, report, which we, um, as always, uh, uh, look carefully into. I must say it's really um, also for us uh, the reference point when it comes to, to looking at what is happening in the market. and. Um, I'm sure this will um, continue to do so and uh, indeed in particular in a times of writing an impact assessment this is you know where you the, the best uh, the best document you can uh, look into and and uh, also um, when reflecting on on preparing for the for the reform um, thanks maybe on um, uh, from this perspective from from what we are uh, looking on the on the uh, hydrogen and decarbonization of gas market package um, indeed thank you for including this uh, section on the new gases because this is um, or the carbonization the carbonized gases because this is indeed um, the focus of of the reform that we are um, preparing. Um, I found already very interesting also the slide of um, of costs um, and production costs that you that you show for for different gases. That is, uh, I think, um, uh, indeed very important. And of course, what uh, what comes out of it is the the difference that needs to be bridged somehow. And uh, um, uh, yeah, fossil gas is um, is. Uh, much cheaper than the renewable alternatives or the carbonized alternatives. So, uh, indeed, this is uh, uh, good also to put uh, numbers uh, on it. You mentioned also in the in the presentation before. I think it was in in still in Joachim's, Joachim's part uh, that uh, demand will be uh, that we also see in until 2050 the um, demand for fossil gas um, uh, going down. Uh, in our um, impact assessment for the um, FIT 55, so the the decarbonized, uh, the 2050 decarbonized market perspective, we uh, we saw there um, that this uh, that the demand for fossil gas goes to one third, but um, it uh, the the demand for um, alternative and decarbonized, uh, sorry, the renewable gases and hydrogen um, is then um, um, to to large extent, at least in, in volumes, filling the gap, but not in energy terms, because indeed hydrogen has then less energy, and um, uh, the uh, uh, energy efficiency and also switch partially to electricity will, um, in total, um, uh, also mean a decrease of of demand for um, for gases. But I think this. Um, projections are quite uh, consistent now and and um, uh, the direction is clear and obviously also what is then important for 2030 and for the for the um, reform that we are preparing which precisely has uh, needs to of course take into account the 2050 perspective but is preparing the the market for a moment um, we need to, to also uh, look into this uh, longer perspective. And I think um, you mentioned this as well, and this was also um, shown in your graph on, on how the capacity is being booked, that um, the long-term capacity bookings are going down. And this is precisely what um, what is uh, in a way also good news from the perspective of the carbonized uh, gases or renewable gases, because if, uh, if the fossil gas long-term contracts um remain in place in the in the magnitude as we have it today and and the related uh, capacity 
uh, bookings. Of course, they, uh, when really this much of uh, fossil gas is being transported, then um, then we um, we indeed uh, may see a problem in in 2050 of of not reaching the projections uh, that we have. But from today's perspective, um, and also this is indicated in these graphs on on capacity bookings, um, it seems that that uh, indeed the, the long term supply contracts are going down as well and and certainly this is a, i think a strong signal that we also have to to send that uh, that we are not uh, surprised and in year 2049 that we that we still have the uh, long term uh, long term uh, contracts in in place um i think marcus you in your last part you you also um uh, mentioned the the network codes and how they have to to evolve with the market i think um, this will need to be indeed uh, the case. We will need to to simply look how um, uh, after after the package has been then negotiated. I'm and I'm speaking about then the, the longer time uh, because it's uh, the current package is being prepared and will be proposed in end of the year. Um, and then we will need certainly one year, maybe maybe one half, two years to to. Finalize it, and and then um, we will be looking into uh, what does it mean then for network codes and and what needs to be um, adapted. Um, and um, here, I mean, looking from the electricity perspective, it's indeed uh, one and a half years more or less to uh, to look after. And then, I think a number of sort of improvements that you that you mentioned related to uh, to funk. Um, Issues can be also addressed and 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 taken up. Um, I um, I also well, you mentioned also um, the issue of um, tarification and that they should not be used for um, for uh, subsidization of uh, decarbonized gases or, or renewable gases. I um, I think that this is uh, of course a fair point and this is absolutely what what uh, what is the current state also of the of the legislation um but uh, we also see that in some member states uh, um, such cross subsidization is taking place and i think there are also arguments that actually from the perspective of uh, sector integration so if um if a consumer um is uh, choosing gas and not choosing electricity and um, then there could be an argument put forward that consumers then of gas should also contribute uh, exclusively consumers of gas should then contribute also to the carbonization of that um, sector because the alternative and we see that there will be news for support the alternative would be indeed state aid and and the um, overall um, taxpayers that will need to be um, need to, will need to contribute but those taxpayers will also then include consumers of of other vectors of energy which maybe uh, already are uh, contributing for to to decarbonization so um there is a there are um arguments i think on 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 both sides and uh, we'll be looking um how uh, to address them but in i think in in this perspective what also is is also good to remember um was the um recent judgment in the in a belgian case where actually we were uh, also welcome it was earlier this year which we were welcoming very much um where the court was stressing um very strongly uh, the independence of the regulators and the uh, the need that um uh, that tarification uh, and decisions um how to put tariffs would should uh, remain with the with the national regulators um uh, and of course to the uh, also in the, in the in the in the frame that then um then the european framework is is uh, envisaging um as we have for example for the um, for the tarification of um uh, or or discounts for storage so there indeed we also have already in the today's perspective uh, rules of of uh, which show that that there is some cross subsidization. Um, I think there is always this uh, huge discussion: what does it mean to uh, 
uh, to cross subsidize or, or not and 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 where where the the issue ends um well but that's uh that's um maybe um on my side uh, again once again thank you very much for for the great report and and uh, really being being on time and and moving also with with the uh, always changing uh, um, um, agenda also on the on the political level so really thank you very much for for taking up this uh, the compensation topics also in this uh, report thank you Okay, thank you, Bartek. And now we have the Q&A session and we already have a number of questions. Uh, so the first one uh, was addressed uh, to uh, Joachim and uh, it is um, on yeah the expected uh, gas mix, if I may uh, summarize it very shortly. Uh, maybe you can uh, answer this one. I read it out once more. Did the first speaker say the important, uh, the import dependency will fall from 70% to 30 to 40% by the middle of the next decade? Uh, from William Powell, and I think uh, he is a journalist. Please, uh, Joachim. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> yeah, I think this is a very good uh, consideration. Um, I think I, that's why we are uh, referring in the in the slide. Of also, although this would be taken with some with some caution, because this is one of a possibility. This is one of one scenario uh, that we are bringing here uh, to illustrate the discussion. But the exact figure uh, we are we are not fully certain. And, and yeah, I mean what we observe uh, or the, the, the estimated uh, average of the of the scenarios is that on the one hand demand will decrease and on the other hand uh, domestic production of low carbon gases uh, will will rise so this will squeeze the, the total volumes that will be imported from external producers but what's the right number uh, to say uh, in 30 from now through 30 years will be will be the market who will be determining that i think this 30 40 is one of the of the ranges that uh, one of the NSOC scenarios, for example, is foreseen, but uh, so there are other scenarios that point to a, a rise in uh, a higher level. So I would take it with, with caution and take more like an illustration than, than our, yeah. this would be my, my reply. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I think this uh, answers the question very well. And there's another one for you, question two. Uh, related to the price differential slide. Uh, the slide with the price differentials compared uh, to the Dutch GDF suggests that the price differential not only increases with market liquidity, but also with the distance from the Netherlands. E.g. Spain has a high liquidity, but also a high price uh, differential. Would you say that uh, this happens uh, due to transport costs, uh, tariff pancaking, or is there some other dimension miss missing in the GTM metrics. Uh, this is from Daniel Hawther. So over to you again, Joachim, please. Yeah, thanks, Margaret, and thanks, Daniel, for, for the question. Indeed, there are a variety of, of drivers that uh, influence price formation and transportation tariffs uh, could be quite relevant for, for some markets, chiefly when, when transportation tariffs uh, are associated to the, to the supply source that tends to set the marginal the marginal price uh, at the market. So what we observe is that for some years now, uh, uh, the price convergence has been increasing. Uh, for example, I think it was in 2016, uh, price differentials between TTF and, and PSB in, uh, in Italy or, or, or with this Iberian hub uh, would be more in the in the three uh, euros per megawatt hour. Now they are closer to, to one, 1 point something, 1.5. Uh, and one of the reasons is because competition is also developing or a stronger competition and, and a higher diversity of supplies also developing in, in those in those markets. Um, so transportation tariffs, I would say, are relevant, but as well are very relevant the, the diversification options, the role of the hub, and, and all these together point build the, the price formation. I don't know if this covers your your consideration, but but yeah, this will be my reply. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think overall the slide shows that uh, the implementation of the GTM 
let's say, leads to the expected results. And I think that's a, that's a good uh, result as well. Uh, so we have now question uh, three. Does ASA have a view on whether the present TSOs should operate hydrogen networks or should that be a separate entity, e.g. to avoid uh, cross-subsidization between gas and uh, hydrogen transport tariffs? Uh, from William Powell again. And I think this is going to Marcus, who uh, referred already to the question of cross-subsidization in the recommendation slide. Please, Marcus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And also, thank you for the question. Well, this is a very central question we also asked ourselves and when we developed the, the white paper on, on hydrogen networks. And, well, our preliminary conclusion in that, in that white paper was that there should be at least an unbundling of accounts. So, exactly for that reason, to avoid cross-subsidization between gas and, and hydrogen, the, the regulated asset bases and the costs should be at least uh, separated from an accounting point of view, meaning doesn't, it doesn't necessarily have to be a uh, legal unbundling. This was sort of that what I can say, and that's what the, the position up until now was, which we have developed in the, in the white papers also. Yes, exactly. Thank you. And uh, indeed, uh, we have um, uh, described a gradual approach to regulation, but making clear that uh, there should be no cross subsidization. Thanks a lot. And uh, the next questions, uh, question four and five, uh, would go to, uh, I think, uh, Baltic uh, addressing uh, issues uh, uh, related uh, to, uh, let's say, the framework and, and policy. So question four uh, is, uh, if ASA and NSOC are persuaded to pursue the efforts come plus funk request further, will this be incorporated into the gas uh, and hydrogen legislation package due in Q4? From Stephen Rose, please, Bartek. Um, yes, so um, the point, maybe maybe let's, um, let's indeed um, put it a little bit into sequence on, on that. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, the issue, what we will need to look at, whether um, uh, all issues, any issues raised in the in the FUNC um, framework, whether they really require a change in the secondary legislation first, and um, because of, of their more fundamental nature. And um, only then, um, if this is uh, the case, then the secondary legislation will be adapted and afterwards the network code will be adapted. Um, if we will consider that the issue is uh, of a more, um, it would be covered under current uh, framework, then it can only, then then it's, it's sufficient that, that then the network code is being adapted. I will not, uh, I, mm -hmm. we don't have yet on this concrete issue uh, um, a conclusive um, uh, conclusion yet, so I cannot answer you now the, very concretely this uh, question, but at least in terms of <laughs> the sequence, um, that is what I wanted to, to put in forward. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, and the next one addresses you directly. It uh, relates also to the uh, question of uh, EC's assessment, and uh, it refers to mm -hmm. whether electrons uh, are zero carbon or will the fuel mix uh, taken into account in the EC's assessment, uh, e.g. for electric vehicles that are recharged using a high fossil uh, fuel grid like in Poland, uh, will this be uh, taken into account uh, or not? Uh, so this is also from William Powell. Yes. And goes to um, Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I would just, uh, I would um, uh, indeed, uh, what what is really remember, uh, important to remember is that we of course look at the decarbonization of the um, entire economy and also at the least cost across all um, all uh, energy sectors. Um, in so uh, yeah, at at the end, of course, uh, all counts in the sense of of uh, of what is being put forward. But um, today, and uh, we are working um, particularly on the situation how to decarbonize um, the consumption of gases because we know that there will be some sectors. 
uh, that will not be able to uh, rely uh, on electricity also in the future. So uh, this is why we are looking how to decarbonize uh, uh, gases. What is then at the same time happening uh, on the electricity side? Obviously there we uh, also having the um, decarbonization agenda and, and putting uh, renewables into um, uh, into the grid for uh, to, to fully um, decarbonize the, the electricity supply, and um, yeah, I don't want now to to discuss the the decarbonization part of the electricity <laughs> sector, but uh, I think this um, all is then uh, taking on the overall level into account. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Thanks a lot uh, for the analysis. And now we have a question six uh, relating to energy bills uh, of uh, consumers, which are becoming more like tax bills. And uh, the question was, how do you combine consumer-centric policy with the fact uh, that uh, bills are to, uh, longer, no longer linked to energy costs? Uh, I would like to say that uh, the, um, this seems to be more relevant on the retail, um, for the retail volume. So I would like to ask you to keep this question in mind when we have a webinar on the retail uh, volume and we try to answer it then. Um, so also in the interest of time, uh, I would uh, pass on then to a, a technical question, which I would uh, give to uh, Mitya and which relates uh, to the multiplier. So the question is, we wait with interest to hear ASA's reasoning why they did not reduce the day ahead uh, within day multiplier um, uh, to uh, cap later this month. Uh, but did uh, ASA also conclude, consider the impact of seasonal factors which combined with multipliers can uh, raise short day ahead prices by 600 to 800% in winter time? Uh, this is from Stephen Rose, and I hope, Mitya, you have an answer to this one, to the technical question. Um, well, first, uh, I'd say um, in that analysis, the seasonal factors were uh, looked into, but there is actually, uh, I, I think, no legal basis for, for any changes to, to, to seasonal uh, multipliers. Um, they're calculated as a as an average across the year, and um, uh, NRAs and TSOs need to comply with with the limits that uh, that were set. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, the the reasoning and um, the report related to the multipliers will indeed be um, published uh, soon. Okay, many thanks. Uh, good to uh, have something to re to wait for. And with this, I see we are at the end of our questions and indeed uh, the time is running as well. So I would like to hand over to Dennis Hessling uh, for um, a concluding remarks. Please over to you, Dennis. Thank you very much, uh, Anna Great. I'm happy to indeed uh, well, conclude or at least let's say wrap up the, the webinar here. Um, I think that the, the topic, the timing, and also the interaction shows that there is a great interest in the gas market in general, and of course, gas decarbonization in particular at this moment in time. We had more than 150 participants in the webinar, so thank you all for joining us. Um, also very relevant, Batek, and, and really appreciate that you could join us here in this very busy time, uh, just ahead of the impact assessment, to share with us your thoughts and reflections on the conclusion that we have found. We've indeed made an effort to publish the findings before the summer rather than after the summer, which I think uh, pays off here. Um, really good to hear that you're open to considering network code changes, uh, which we've been putting forward or suggesting for quite some time. And we realize that there's more on the Commission's agenda than just these ones, uh, but still for the proper market functioning and we measure the effects as good as we can, um, this plays a role. The way things are formulated and implemented and can be, um, uh, well, can be properly uh, made to function in practice uh, depends to some extent on the, the proper formulation and some changes over time are needed as the gas market changes as well. So uh, what I take from your, your comment, Bartek, is that in maybe one and a half, two years, um, we would indeed have an opening to um, 
to change the network codes where this may be needed. Um, and, and we think we'll keep on collecting uh, those issues through the Funk platform or otherwise uh, to make sure we have a proper uh, list by that time and to make sure that the, the regulatory framework can adapt uh, over time to the needs of the markets and the market participants. The other discussion you mentioned, Patek, on the cross-subsidization, that's a bit more tricky one. I think you've heard our arguments, you know our arguments. Um, we also hear what you say when you speak about, well, who should then pay the bill? Should it be the general taxpayer? Because as we showed also, I think the shadow that Joaquin showed, there need to be subsidies in the beginning to make sure these renewable low carbon gases can actually take off. Uh, and there is a cost gap at the moment, maybe over time with um, higher uh, EU allowances, maybe with uh, more volume effects, uh, we would get to a state where the market itself can, can pick it up, like we've seen for renewable electricity generation, but we're clearly not there yet. So there is a question of um, well, subsidizing, making sure that uh, renewable and low carbon gases can come into the market at the speed that they need to, um, and then who needs to pick up the bill? That's a question we um, we will have to um, we'll have to address, and we'll look forward to your comments and to your uh, well to the impact assessment, Bartek, once it comes out. With that, I see that we're almost to the end of the webinar, so let me um, thank all our speakers, um, Joaquin, Micha, and Marcus, of course, who have done all the work uh, internally with the colleagues. Um, Anna Great, thanks a lot for being with us, for chairing, and for moderating the session. Uh, there are two more colleagues uh, whom you haven't seen but who are working behind the screens to make this uh, this possible were Andra and Christina so thanks a lot to them as well you don't see them here but they were really necessary to make this webinar a success and then finally let me just mention a few events which are coming up in the next weeks um, you know July the 14th 14 uh, the Commission will publish its fit for 55 package uh, we will publish the gas wholesale webinar so you can choose you have lots of things to read on that day um, as Joaquin said, there is this new chapter on decarbonization. Um, that's something which is a new topic for us. And obviously, we're looking at the market from the outside. We pick up um, the data that we can find, uh, that we work on in an analytical and transparent way. Um, but if you have any feedback, things that we missed or you think we misunderstood or where we can improve, we'll be happy to pick up your comments and suggestions. So don't hesitate to reach out uh, to make sure that we um, well, we also get uh, comments and suggestions, uh, both the positive ones and the more constructive, critical ones uh, from the market. Then the next day, July 15, there will be a CER uh, webinar on the work program for 2022, uh, where the new strategy will be presented and it's for comments. It's a draft work program. So if you have any comments, suggestions on what CER, so the NRAs, let's say, uh, at European level uh, should be doing uh, next year, you'll be welcome to join them on July the 15th. And then finally, we'll have one more webinar. Um, that's a webinar on methane emissions, and that will be scheduled for early September. So methane emissions, ACER CER, uh, on a forthcoming white paper. And then just to Steve Rose, the, the document in need on the uh, multipliers, uh, we have a board of regulators meeting next week. Uh, after that, the documents will be released. So you'll see it in uh, a week or so. It will be available on our website. With that, I think we are nicely on time. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you here with us. Uh, and please stay in touch with us for our documents, publications, and webinars. And thank you, and goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, many thanks. Bye -bye.